Accounts of events in history commonly disagree on what really happened. Historians rarely have a video replay to serve as a reliable, unbiased observer. Instead, we find ourselves with mysteries to unravel. How do we figure out what really happened? And moreover, can we learn anything important as we unravel the truth from the fiction? Well, let's find out. I'm Tom Army. Welcome to this United States History online video. We're going to talk about what we might learn from the variation in eyewitness accounts of historical events. July 1863. Two armies collided. The Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, General Robert E. Lee commanding, and the Union Army of the Potomac, General George G. Meade commanding. It happened in a small crossroads town, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Historians generally agree what happened at Gettysburg shaped the final two years of the Civil War, taking the strategic initiative away from the Confederacy and giving it to the Union. A piece of the historical account of this battle remains, however, controversial. I want to raise several questions with you that highlight the importance of historical analysis. So for the better part of nine hours on July 1st, 1863, Confederate soldiers under the command of Major General A.P. Hill and Lieutenant General Richard S. Ewell engaged in a ferocious struggle with men from the Union Army's 1st and 11th Corps. The Confederates had pushed the Northerners savagely across the town of Gettysburg and into the hills beyond. Robert E. Lee, the Confederate commander, did not want this battle to erupt. He feared that a general engagement with the enemy before his entire army arrived in Gettysburg could end in a disaster. He still had Lieutenant General James Longstreet's corps eight to ten miles from Gettysburg. A general engagement, however, had started contrary to Lee's plan. So Lee could only hope his men now in the fight could finish it. He knew a total victory that day in Gettysburg could possibly allow him to negotiate independence for the Confederacy. Now imagine. Complete chaos reigned in the center of Gettysburg late in the afternoon of July 1st. Confederate officers were desperately trying to regroup their regiments. About 2,000 Yankee prisoners clogged the streets. Soldiers desperately searched for water. Men met frustration trying to evacuate wounded soldiers. And southern supply wagons had ground to a halt one or two miles away on the jammed roads leading to town. So as General Ewell entered Gettysburg with fierce fighting in progress, he received an order from Lee urging him to press the attack on Cemetery Hill if he, quote, could do so to advantage, end quote. But Ewell didn't attack. By the following morning, the Union Army had dug in positions on Cemetery Hill and on the hill next to it, Culp's Hill, and Ewell had squandered the apparent opportunity for a swift victory. General Isaac Trimble accompanied General Ewell that fateful afternoon, and after the war, he wrote that attacking Cemetery Hill was the critical moment. Trimble reportedly said to Ewell, General, give me a division and I will take that hill. Ewell declined. Trimble said, give me a brigade and I will do it. 
fuel still declined. Trimble tried again, give me a good regiment and I will engage that hill. Yule declined. Trimble then threw down his sword and stormed away, reportedly saying he would no longer serve under Yule. Now, this dramatic scene comes to life vividly in the movie Gettysburg, which I hope some of you have watched. And if you see it in a movie, I believe you feel that it rings true. Now, historians generally agree that Trimble spoke these lines. For over a century, Civil War students have believed Ewell failed to take the hills outside Gettysburg, and thus costing the South a chance of victory at the crucial Battle of Gettysburg. Other evidence, however, suggests an entirely different version of this story. Ewell did decide, wisely, not to attack Cemetery Hill because he recognized that Union artillery commanded the approach to the objective. Instead, Ewell sent out a scouting party. The scouting party went to Culp's Hill, and they probably climbed the eastern slope Culp's Hill was a tree-covered rise just southeast of Cemetery Hill. These scouts reported back that they could find no one on Culp's Hill. About the same time, one of Ewell's brigade commanders, Extra Billy Smith, reported a sighting of Union infantry along the York Road threatening Ewell's flank. Indeed, lead elements of a Union infantry corps had moved into that area, but the Confederate scouts apparently misidentified the name of the road. The infantry was on the Hanover Road, not the York Road. Enemy lurking on his flank created a dangerous situation, so Ewell sent one of his three divisions east to protect this vulnerable flank. Ewell still had another division available under the command of Jubal Early. That division had fought and marched all day and Early informed Ewell that his men were in no condition to take Culp's Hill. That left Ewell with but one remaining division under the command of Edward Allegheny Johnson. Johnson's soldiers, however, sat two hours distance from Gettysburg, stuck on the jammed roads. So Ewell had no remaining options. Now at nightfall, Johnson's troops finally arrived, and Ewell told Johnson to take Culp's Hill, the hill adjacent to Cemetery Hill. In the time since Ewell's first reconnaissance, however, the situation on Culp's Hill had changed. The 7th Indiana Union Infantry had now occupied the top of the summit. When Johnson sent his own 25-man scouting party up the dark hillside, men from the 7th Indiana ambushed them. Union soldiers captured several of the scouts and the rest of the scouting party quickly withdrew. These scouts reported to Johnson that a, quote, superior force of the enemy, end quote, held Culp's Hill. Johnson, now believing Culp's Hill well defended, received a captured enemy dispatch that added to his problems. This dispatch suggested a brand new threat. Part of a Union Corps, Major General George Sykes's Federal Fifth Corps, apparently only five miles away, was approaching Johnson's flank on the Hanover Road. In the face of this new information, Johnson elected to delay any advances until he received further orders. 
You will then return from Lee's headquarters at 3 a.m. with new orders instructing Johnson to hold his troops in place. Now let me ask you something. Why would two different versions of what happened with regard to Culp's Hill in the Battle of Gettysburg persist, even today? Now you might notice that the facts in both versions do not actually conflict. The second version only adds facts that appear to change our understanding of what happened and why. In the first version, perhaps we see an example of a subordinate not following the commands given him by a superior officer. In the second version, we may appreciate that a commanding officer has a set of objectives but expects and trusts his subordinates to adjust their actions according to the situation that arise. The study of history should train us to question and evaluate the veracity of all the stories we hear and read. Version 2 of Culp's Hill story seems to make more sense to us because it relies upon all the information at hand and not just some particular set of facts. And it appears more consistent with the nature of the individuals involved than we have gleaned from other accounts of their behavior. Why go to the trouble of constantly searching for the truth? Each of us may have a different answer to that question. I might say we use history consciously or subconsciously every day to make decisions in our own personal lives. Mostly we use our own personal history, but as a society we use our collective history to make choices. As we each interpret that history differently, we end up with a variety of opinions on every issue. But inherently we believe we will make better decisions as a society if we have a common sense of truth. So think for just a second. Do we believe that Christopher Columbus was a great man who brought the indigenous uncivilized people of Latin America out of paganism and into Christianity? Do we believe that African Americans played no role in their own emancipation? Do we believe that women played no part in the historical narrative of our nation's founding? Do we believe the American Indians lacked any ethical standards and John Wayne led a truly noble band of good guys in the American West? Do you believe that General Ewell failed to do his duty and thus determined the outcome of the American Civil War? <laughs>